Hi, I'm Peter Mesaros from the Netherlands. I'm a self-made investor, teacher. I would like to help you to navigate in this crazy world. This is my second interview with Rick, and this is the second part. In this you can learn about how to value mining companies. The first part was about the Fed and where to invest now. And the third will be about the principles to navigate this environment and the precious metals manipulation. Stay tuned for this as well. Uh, but uh, but now we have this current environment and I think we are more happy if they raise rates and for example I also want to buy um, real estate so if, if the price declines I, I'm more happy uh, but we, we have an idea of value and not just about the price right so um, could you please summarize how to calculate the net asset value of um, of a company for example a, a mine or should I tell my version and you correct me? Well, first of all, yes, you should tell your version. But I need to say uh, that you're never going to get it really right. Uh, the that's idea the is just nice. to get it just to get it more right than your competition, uh, and to have a sense too that if you don't have an opinion as to value, price information is irrelevant. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so let's let you start with that caveat. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I, I summarize it, we don't have a limited time, but uh, yeah, of course I, I research first the background, uh, uh, the management and so, uh, uh, but but now we, we get to the numbers and then what I do is uh, I, I see what asset the company has, what assets, and then I imagine or I, I read, I research out what uh, cash flow from these assets I can expect ideally for the next 10 years and then uh, then i discount them with a formula and there you have there you are uh, we have we have a number and i use a five percent discount rate am i close yeah you're very close okay. uh, i in terms of my discount rate mine floats mm -hmm. i use uh on current net present value the us 10-year rate plus 300 basis points okay okay uh, and when I uh, decide to be more sophisticated than not, which, by the way, doesn't make me more accurate, it just somehow makes me more confident, uh, I look at the um, futures market in the U.S. 10-year treasury, and I add 300 basis points to that. So okay. if the yield curve is steepening, as an example, uh, I use higher terminal interest rates. <clears throat> I look at enterprise value. Okay, yeah. Uh, which is to say, I don't penalize companies that don't have much debt. Uh, rather than merely looking at market capitalization, uh, I look at enterprise value to net present value as my valuation metric. Okay. Uh, uh, and I also attempt from a qualitative viewpoint to understand uh, redundant assets uh, and uh, developmental stage assets. Uh, for developmental stage assets, uh, of course, you need to do uh, projected net present values, and you try to you try to discount as best you can uh, for the time necessary to permit and finance, uh, and then you also discount by the probability uh, of them able being able to do it and you being right. What's important in all of this is two things, Peter. The first is investors need to have the understanding that price information is irrelevant if you don't have a sense of value. And the second is to understand that you're never going to get it right. Yeah. The search, the search for perfection is a different form of procrastination. <laughs> I, as an example, often use a matrix, uh, both of commodity prices mm -hmm. uh, and also of probabilities. The commodity price matrix gives me a sense of whether I should assign any value in my valuation to optionality. And it also gives me the ability to stress test. So as an example, if the copper price is at $4, I'll run a $4 case. I'll run a $3 case <laughs> and I'll run a $7 case. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't believe in any of them. Uh, but the fact that I have a matrix of valuations gives me a better way to put the price information in context. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I forgot that. In, for example, in case of gold, you do it with $180 uh, 
perhaps an optimistic 2,200 and a pessimistic 1,500 or your choice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I and, must tell you that my optimistic case is more optimistic, but uh, anyway. Of course. <laughs> so I, I think we both expect from gold uh, higher dollar dollar term value, but yeah. And and uh, do you use like uh, uh, when you say that uh, the ba base rate of the U.S. Treasury plus uh, three hundred basis points? Yes, sir. Uh, do you use like okay pl plus four hundred or five hundred basis point if the uh, jurisdic jurisdic jurisdiction is a bit uh, ri more risky? Do you? Uh, do you I do don't. That uh, I don't. Sometimes I add in an overlay. In other words, my discount rate doesn't vary much by jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but my input cost does. Uh -huh. So if I'm assuming, uh, as an example, uh, a developmental asset that's in the United States that's controlled by a company that's an investment grade company and can finance on balance sheet, then the cost of capital that I'm using is prime. If, by contrast, uh, my issuer is a non-investment grade issuer and the project is in Mali uh, or someplace like that, uh, what I use then as a cost of funds is <clears throat> the country's US dollar cost of funds plus again, 300 basis points. So as an example, Mali is a credit, maybe paying uh, 900 basis points. Uh, and then I assume a 300 or a 350 basis point premium to that. Uh, and if my project finance involves a 65% debt stack uh, and it's a billion dollar project, then I assume $650 million uh, at some number like 12 and a half plus. In other words, I don't discount it differently, but I factor in a cost of capital yeah, that in and of itself factors in political risk. Uh, okay, so the cost of capital is higher. Okay, and and when there is no cash flow yet, uh, then uh, then you wait for the feasibility study or, or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Uh, okay. I, I like to be early if I'm rewarded uh. for being early. So I will provide capital to a company, even on a debt basis, uh, for any type of catalytic investment, which is to say any type of investment, which I think will increase the certainty that somebody can use to calculate the net present value of a project, even a preliminary economic assessment. Uh, if I see a, a junior company with an exploration asset that's got enough holes in it that I can define a, a target size uh, with some probabilities. And the company is going to do a preliminary economic assessment. Mm -hmm. If I think that the preliminary economic assessment is being done with uh, a high enough quality engineering firm that investors will look at the result of the assessment as being a valuation indicator, uh, I will in fact lend against that asset. I will only lend uh, up to about 35% of the project value. Mm -hmm. And by project value, I don't mean the market capitalization of the issuer, but rather my estimate of what I could sell the project for to a different company. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that the market capitalization of the issuer is $30 million. Uh, it may be that if the project is, let's say in Northwestern BC and is ad adjacent to Skeena or Teuton or something like that, that I believe that they could sell the project based on the data at hand <clears throat> for argument's sake, let's say $5 million. I'd be likely to lend a million and a half uh, against the five senior secured uh, in the sense that uh, a reasonable preliminary economic assessment, once it was achieved, would lend enough credibility to the project that the market cap would increase enough that the company would be able to raise equity on more attractive terms and take me out. Yeah, and then, then you have also margin of safety. Correct. Uh, okay. And... Um... Yeah, about the uncertainty. I also had a question. So, the, of course, we have always uncertainty. 
but if I if I do these calculations, and I did, then I I, I see <clears throat> that uncertainty in this sector is huge. <laughs> so from year to year, within one company, even uh, I have brought up one example, the first majestic example. Uh, which will now increase their gold production by 40%, maybe on one asset. And, and it will be like more a gold company than a silver company. So how, how, how do we deal with this uncertainty, with this huge uncertainty? Uh, it's, it comes with experience that I can handle it better? Or Well, in, 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 the, curse of, in the case of First Majestic, uh, they uh, enjoyed quite a dramatic run-up in price seven or eight months ago. Uh, which I felt was probably excessive, and I was a seller. When First Majestic acquired Jarrett Canyon, the question became, uh, would First Majestic's proven ability to buy large projects that have been capital starved uh, mm. and inject capital and intelligence in them, uh, would that be sufficient to turn around Jarrett Canyon? Uh, Jarrett Canyon is a huge opportunity and a huge risk for First Majestic. And what I'm going to do personally is sit out of that name until I begin to see some evidence that the ability and the willingness that First Majestic has to invest 100 or $120 million in that asset, which is what it needs, mm -hmm. uh, will and is bearing fruit. Certainly, if you look at their track record with assets like San Dimas, uh, taking over very large, historic, and importantly, cash-starved assets, assets that were milked, uh, or at least where the prior management team couldn't, wouldn't, or didn't uh, make sustaining capital investments, uh, First Majestic has been uh, really spectacular taking those assets taking the hard steps necessary to turn around the assets, including very, very, very large capital investments uh, and restoring them to incredible profitability. So I am in my own mind believing that the team can do that, but until they've demonstrated it to me, <laughs> I'm staying out of the way. Yeah, I learned from you that uh, Keith Neumeyer can uh, uh, allocate the capital wisely. Uh, okay. And, and if, if we discuss one company, can we a little bit just uh, touch uh, Trilogy? Uh, because now, uh, yeah, a few months ago when it was uh, also the, the price declined because their, uh, uh, their, their, their government did not approve their project immediately, uh, their old building. Do you think it's... Uh, good value today or or shall, shall we think like okay if i buy this company now uh, I, I i buy an asset which will come into production in seven or eight years we put this aside and then probably also the copper price will increase and then i will be happy if i can do this uh, work now this investment now i am a very small scale uh, mm -hmm. trilogy investor i'm I'm a sucker for grade, uh, and I'm also a sucker for exploration upside. I think Trilogy represents a district, not a mine. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so I'm a small scale investor. What would make me a larger scale investor is I'm hoping to go up and visit mm -hmm. personally uh, with a consultant who's an old friend of mine, who I think will be more likely than me to be able to gauge the community will with regard to the indigenous communities that I think are the future of that deposit. If the coordinated council of tribal governments in Alaska, the 11 tribal governments in Alaska got solidly behind the project. And if there was enough sense uh, in the community that the community would tell the federal government, the state's not the problem, mm -hmm. to get out of the way and let this happen, this project happens. If, uh, if the Native councils uh, tell Mr. Biden that they regard him as a white racist interloper, uh, impeding their economic development goals, this project gets approved. 
if community relations is handled the same way that, as an example, the community relations at Pebble were handled, uh, this project goes to Project Heaven, uh, which is to say it never gets built. So you're going to have to analyze the company's uh, community relations efforts, and you're going to have to analyze the sociology, not only of the uh, local and regional bands, but rather the local and regional bands' ability to mobilize the political will of the native community of the whole state of Alaska. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they are very powerful and very sophisticated players politically now. The lack of capacity that burdened the uh, First Nations or indigenous communities in Alaska 30 years ago was a thing of the past. Okay, yeah, it's a good idea. I will ask this uh, from them. And uh, as, a, as a natural resource investor or investors, we, at least we have a fear now that, okay, inflation is rising, it, it doesn't go away, supply chain risks, so the production cost goes higher and this affects us negatively. How, how should we think about that? Well, I think it's something that you need to consider, uh, particularly in development stage assets. Mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing inflation throughout the supply chain. Uh, and in particular, we're seeing inflation in the cost of capital. Uh, as share prices fall, the equity cost of capital increases. Yeah. Uh, the rising interest rate, of course, uh, impacts uh, debt financing. And in addition to that, ESG considerations are lowering the ability of multilateral financial institutions and very large banks to provide project finance, particularly off balance sheet limited recourse project finance. In addition to that, uh, we are seeing rapid increases in the cost of skilled labor. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole industry is being hurt, both because the labor force by now in extractive industries is very old, there hasn't been replenishment of the labor force for 25 years. Uh, also, because uh, communities that were traditionally attracted to employment in extractive industries uh, are looking at more urban vocations. And we're seeing uh, inflation in social rents, which is to say fees and taxes, mm -hmm. as well as rampant inflation in finished manufacturing goods, in steel, in cement, and my suspicion is that uh, our industry became used to input inflation in the period 1980 uh, to 2022 that might have averaged 3 or 4% compounded. I mean, certainly we had a couple years, 2004, 2005, 2006, where the input uh, inflation was higher. But I think that we have to get used to input inflation now uh, on project assumptions that sort of 10% compounded. A very <laughs> different order of magnitude. Yeah, and as you started, it came into my mind that uh, this affects uh, those projects uh, more the, that still have to be built. And those that are already Correct. ready and, and in production, they enjoy uh, that they were built in a period when there was less inflation. Yeah, okay. Correct. And, and inflation, uh, inflation mm -hmm. really enhances the value of established paid for yeah. infrastructure. Uh, okay. Okay. And um, not as a prediction, of course, but how do you imagine the natural resource sector in five, 10 years? Uh, absent, a, absent a global recession or depression, yeah. which yeah. I think could happen. Yeah. Uh, I think there are extraordinary opportunities in front of us. Uh, society has underinvested in extractive activities for 30 years. Uh, the decade of the 80s saw fairly high investment as a consequence of the, ex the experience in the 1970s. Uh, but save for a very brief hiatus, uh, a recovery in investment occurring beginning sort of 2004, 2005, going through 2009, 2010, the last 30 years has been marked on a global basis by a substantial underinvestment in productive capacity for extractive industries. And the chickens are gonna come home to roost. They're not investing because the political class, while they say to invest, has also said that they're gonna legislate the industry out of existence in 2030. How can you make long-term investments if the government doesn't want you to have a future? Uh, they're also not investing because the investment community wants a return of capital. Uh, 
rather than a return on capital, which is to say that the industry is being decapitalized. It's estimated that the oil business right now, while enjoying 50% operating margins, are underinvesting in new project and sustaining capital investments to the extent of a billion and a half dollars a day. Half a trillion dollars a year. Uh, what that means is in a, an industry where all of your assets are depleting on a daily basis, that we are destroying productive capacity on a daily basis today. Yeah. Uh, and that means that if something doesn't happen politically uh, or in terms of companies' ability and willingness to spend, that we will experience production shortages, supply shortages, uh, inescapably in five years, unless demand deteriorates as a consequence of a deteriorating global economy. Yeah. I also see that, for example, copper is now about a 20 million tons business, but in 2030, there will be a 5, 10 million uh, ton deficit. And, and we should- Tremendous from, deficit. Yeah, from, from 2025, yep. uh, we, should, we should name the, the metals that will be not in deficit. So yeah, uh, I also see then uh, the opportunity. And uh, yeah, so people, uh, Dear viewers, if you want to learn more about this, I think then you should uh, visit uh, uh, the, the the symposium for, of Rick. Uh, he, he he did not uh, made me to tell this. I'm just a satisfied customer. So I think if you go there, it's in a, a few weeks, about a month from now. So you still have time. You should go there. Uh, you can learn a lot. If you go there, you get immediately a list of uh, stocks. Uh, where uh, Sprott and Rick invest its own money, and uh, you can learn more about that. So I think I, I, it's, it's really good value, I think, and I, I support that. So uh, am I mistaken, Rick? Well, to demonstrate that it's good value, uh, in every educational product that I've put on for the last 30 years, I've had a full money-back guarantee. So if you pay the commission, uh, the tuition, pardon me, and you come down to Boca Raton, uh, July 26th through 29th, and you don't think you got your money's worth, I'll give you your money back. Uh, I, I don't know of any other investment conference on the planet that has that much confidence uh, in their curriculum and in their track record to make that statement. Uh, I've been making that statement for 30 years, and I'm delighted to say that the products that we've delivered over 30 years have been so uh, outstanding that we've had to refund substantially less than one half of 1% of the tuitions that we've charged over the last 30 years. But nonetheless, the economic risk is mine. Yeah, and I paid my, uh, the ticket, so I, I will be there. Uh, that's the goal. Thank you for watching part two. Please don't forget to watch the first part and the third part later. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and to visit Rick's Symposium. Please find the links in the description below. See you, have a nice day.